we ready to get started? Okay. Can you hear me okay? Is it working? It's working okay? All right. First, there was a missing person. Adam Rosenberg with his new haircut was unidentified. Please find Joel Malinsky. He's looking for you. Okay, good, good. Just kidding. First of all, welcome everybody to the uh, third Michigan Hemp Industries um, meeting. We're calling it a uh, networking uh, public meeting. I'm Michael Camorn of Camorn Law PLC. I'm also the lawyer for the Michigan Hemp Industries. And as uh, has been our kind of intentions here, we're trying to gather those people that are interested in hemp and industrial hemp in light of the federal passage of the hemp bill and Michigan's movement in that uh, in the same. And we've been gathering periodically to try to educate and network and kind of bring people within the state of Michigan together. And uh, tonight is uh, gathered a great group of speakers that I want to mention briefly. First, uh, I understand he's got a brand new presentation, all kinds of new uh, graphics. Alan Peisner is going to be speaking again on the uh, hemp history. A new issue that has come up, not just in uh, for cannabis, but specifically now regarding hemp, is the issues regarding and protecting intellectual property. And uh, Chris Dolinsky from our law firm is going to be discussing that. Also, uh, Stephanie Lana of the Hemp Industries is going to speak about uh, the Hemp Industries National Organization and she's probably going to mention an event that is coming up uh, that she's involved with, involving a screening of a hemp movie and a gathering, something similar to this. I don't think the food's going to be as good. It may be better. I don't know. Stephanie can explain that. And um, we're excited also. We've got a, a state representative, Sherry Gay Dagnago, who is going to be uh, appearing a little later, I understand around 7 she'll be here to discuss uh, her perspective on the state's and the legislative uh, response and what, what she anticipates going forward. And even though we have listed uh, Dawn Schultz, she's uh, not going to speak the next time she, we gather. She will probably have much to say, so we'll tease you with that. But uh, Roman Visichill is going to discuss some other events that are happening throughout the state and nationally and internationally. And I want to invite anybody else that has anything they want to add at the end. Uh, talk to Dan or Jesse, and we can have you come up and discuss whatever you'd like to talk about. Um, I did want to talk a few things before I turn the microphone over to Alan for the history of hemp, and that is some of the things that I think are important for those interested in the industry to think about. And uh, we had discussed this a little bit at the meeting that we had in Ann Arbor, and I just wanted to reemphasize these important things, and I think as an organization we want to keep these on our on the forefront, the dashboard, and uh, be mindful of them and as we build membership and have uh, a uh, you know better, more specific governance. I think we should be at the table when these issues are being discussed at the, at the legislative level. And what I'm talking about is um, well, a couple of things. First of all, at our last meeting, we had discussed how frustrated the people were in Michigan because there was the requirement in the pilot project in Michigan that there be a university signed up for the application being approved for either a hemp farming pilot project license or one for processing. And we discussed uh, two things at the last meeting. One is we were all going to buy a school, going together on that. And also we were going to um, petition the governor to lift that particular requirement, that being of uh, a university. And we did draft the letter and we sent it. And all people that are here tonight, you can also take credit as we are, that we uh, convinced the governor to lift the requirement of the university being involved for these pilot projects going forward. Now, with that being said, I will concede that there's a lot of other forces that were out there whispering in the governor's ear, and there may have been multiple reasons why it happened. But for tonight, we can all say that we're, we were responsible. And just to, for, for showing by showing of hands, is there anyone in the room has gotten a uh, either a hemp license to grow or process? Wow, look at all that. 
booming industry. That's right. Give yourself a <laughs> now. It's it's rather fascinating because this thing happened overnight, and uh, unlike all that we've learned from the MMFLA or the licensing process regarding cannabis, which involves a lot of uh, you know individual scrutiny, bank accounts, costs for licenses, it has not been this way, and all this, of course, is being managed by MDART and not Lara. And uh, so far, so good. I know that there's. Um, the hundred dollars only to get a planting license for farming, and uh, it's thirteen fifty for processing. And there's very few, if any, limitations or rules associated with this. I mean, I remember speaking a couple weeks ago at some event, and someone asked me, you know, whether they could grow their hemp plants with their medical marijuana caregiver plants, and you know, they began a whole slew of questions and whatnot. And I, I uh, just to answer that question, I, you know, the MDART is not giving much direction on this. And I don't know, in that particular scenario, that of course, the MMA activity is private and shouldn't be something that's disclosed and it's locked in and closed and it should not be an issue. But it, it, it brought that up mostly to point out there, there are very few rules and regulations currently that anyone has been given to uh, operate. And I just say that as a uh, matter of just to be mindful and some of the concerns that, that may develop. And as we spoke about in the past, when I think ultimately our goal as an organization should be out of the gate and we will ultimately be um, communicating about this in greater detail, but the concept of formulating a hemp industries association or hemp farming bill of rights. And I say that because of the way in which the farming and processing of this particular plant is currently identified and treated and written about and the oversight of it is as if it's still illegal. And uh, we wanna try to do all we can to ensure that the government does not treat this plant that has been um, displaced from the Controlled Substances Act to something that's not illegal anymore, is not treated like something that's illegal. If I was to suggest and, or even just briefly summarize what I'm talking about for the Bill of Rights in, in theory, it's that you treat hemp farmers like you would any other farmer and don't do anything different in the, the oversight of that that you wouldn't for other farmers. And currently, even though there isn't any um, guidelines that exist that MDART is disclosing, there are some concerns that people should be aware of. And I just mentioned this in passing in and uh, I, I, I hope by the next time we meet, there'll be some more direction. And I, and I do think that MDART is going to be looking for input. And uh, my interactions with them has been that they are figuring it out as, as they go along, so to speak. But for purposes of growers and processors, th those that have licenses consent to all the following. That would be entry onto and inspection of all premises by the department or law enforcement agencies. This may not be something that goes along with other farming activities. With or without cause, and with or without advance notice, where industrial hemp or industrial hemp cultivation equipment or materials are located or to be located. So we have that as a dilemma, which is that currently at any time, 24-7, the government can come in and examine your plants. I don't know that anyone is getting a license or being told that. That's what the statute says under the pilot project. And I think it's something that, you know, goes to the heart of the matter of from the farming community and processing community that we not allow this to be even contemplated for the industry going forward. It's going to cause tremendous problems and um, is not part of what should be the traditional regulations associated with the farming. And of course, as has been discussed in the past, the issue of the testing and what is going to connote, you know, a failed or hot plant at what stage. Of course, the statute itself speaks to dry weight, 3.3% THC level. But, you know, is it a first pass that fails? Is there a secondary testing? Is there a chance to, you know, come back in a couple weeks? Is it all the plants? You know, there's a lot that is going to be going into the investment of these farming and the expectations of it, and we want to have sensible oversight and sensible regulation and not uh, something that is uh, rules and regulations that are going to cause problems as the industry unfolds and as, you know, Michiganders try to develop uh, the industrial hemp industry. So those are some of the concerns I have. 
uh, that we should all be mindful of. And um, I should say this, you know, as a, as a lawyer, I know that, um, you know, the involvement of cannabis in the criminal justice system is, uh, makes up 40% of the business that's done there. And oddly, the manner by which they determine that it is marijuana has nothing to do with THC content. It is just the presence of THC. That's a sad state of affairs for anyone that is, you know, being charged with a marijuana offense. But worse yet, as we move into this new era of not just federally approved cannabis sativa L plant as being not marijuana, but hemp, something completely redefining it as, we still live in a state where the Michigan State Police, the Forensic Science Division, cannot delineate the percentages of THC. They only test for and are set up to test the presence of THC. So put that in your pipe and smoke it.